become aware of, of everything like that, you know? How, how does he see? And uh, I was meditating on this question for a long time. And then one day I was taking a walk. And I was walking along the beach. I was on Guam, an island in the Pacific. And it was a very hot day. And I was walking along. And all of a sudden I had this incredible vision where I was, I was uh, scooped up by this giant hand. Uh, and here I was, about the size of one of these ants, sitting on this hand. Uh, and the hand was going up like this. It was accelerating, you know. And I was being pushed into the hand by the, by the force of acceleration. And uh, it was like, it was dizzying. I got vertigo. I was like, wow, where are we going? Higher and higher and higher. Uh, and finally, the motion stopped. And everything was very quiet. And so I crawled over to the edge of the hand. <laughs> and I looked down. <laughs> it's like, where are we anyway? And we were like hundreds of miles up in the sky, you know, looking down at the, at the uh, ocean. And the ocean, the ocean just, just extended. There was no horizon. This ocean just extended like unlimitedly. There was no edge, there was no, no border to it. It just went on and on and on and on. And I was <laughs> looking at this like, wow. You know? And then I looked down and I looked closer. And it's like, I could see every drop in that ocean was a separate individual living entity. Yeah, this was just like mind blowing, right? Mind blow. So then I was sitting on the hand like this, and then the hand started to turn like this. And pretty soon I was facing directly the Lord's face. And I can't describe you what I saw. <laughs> I can't describe it. It was just, it was, it was too amazing. But anyway, I had to come back because it was, it was so... I didn't want to go. I wanted to just like stay there. And, you know, it was too wonderful. But anyway, I had to come back. So then I came back, and it was just a second later. My foot was hitting the ground. I had taken one step. The whole experience felt like it took like 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But it all happened just during one step of walking along the beach. So I'm going, OK, Krishna. <laughs> You know, there are certain things that are not for us to understand because they're beyond our limited capacity. And even if we're given a vision or a symbol, a metaphor, we still can't understand it. Uh, now who can understand an ocean that has no border, that has no end? You know, this is like this is beyond the capacity of the <laughs> jiva soul to understand. So Krishna is very great. <laughs> 27. Self-satisfied. A person who is fully satisfied in himself without any hankering and who is not agitated even in the presence of serious cause for distress is called self-satisfied. An example of Krishna's self-satisfaction was exhibited when he, Arjuna, and Bhima went to challenge Jarasandha, the formidable king of Magadha. And Krishna gave all credit to Bhima for the killing of Jarasandha. From this we can understand that Krishna never cares at all for fame, although no one can be more famous. An example of his not being disturbed was shown when Shishupal began to call him ill names. All the kings and brahmanas assembled at the sacrificial arena of Maharaj Yudhishthira became perturbed and immediately wanted to satisfy Krishna by offering nice prayers. But all these kings and brahmanas could not discover any disturbance in Krishna's person. See, we're not like that. As soon as someone begins to criticize us, or as soon as someone insults us, or uh, calls us a bad name, you know, and we immediately become 
very agitated and you know righteously defend ourselves and or fight back you know and retaliate and all this. But Krishna is not like that. Krishna doesn't care for anybody's opinion. He's independent. He has his own source of energy, his own independent source of happiness. See, within himself. He's self-satisfied. Atma Rama. Atma means spirit or soul, and Rama means pleasure. See, so Atma Rama means he is satisfied with his own self, his own spiritual energy. And he doesn't require any outside help to feel happiness or to feel satisfaction. So, just like Krishna doesn't require to enjoy anything outside himself, also he's not disturbed by any displeasure from outside himself. It's simply irrelevant. Shishupal calling Krishna ill names. I mean, this is, this is like an ant uh, trying to curse a cow. You know, it's just <laughs> ridiculous. The ant has no power to, to curse a cow. You know, so similarly, uh, someone like Shishupal has absolutely no influence on a great personality like Krishna. Krishna is the greatest personality. You know, even uh, great sages and demigods are like nothing to Krishna. He doesn't care for them. But he becomes very attached to his devotees. So we'll see this again and again in the Shastra, that even great demigods like Brahma can offer Krishna prayers and, and like this. And Krishna is just sort of like, you know, ho oh, hum. Um, I wonder what Radharani is cooking. You know? <laughs> but he's not, he's not concerned either with praise or blame. Neither one disturbs him. Because he has his own independent source of pleasure. And so do we, actually. If we become Krishna conscious, we have Krishna within ourselves. And he is giving, automatically uh, giving pleasure and satisfaction to the surrendered souls. We don't need any uh, outside pleasure. Huh? I've described this so many times. All you have to do is sit down and turn your consciousness within and contemplate your own consciousness, your own self, uh, your Atma. Atma is already eternal and spiritual. And so when uh, the Atma, the spiritual self, the soul, is in contact with spiritual energy, we automatically feel pleasure. See? So even if that spiritual energy is our own self, we'll feel that pleasure. This is the beginning of spiritual bliss. But even, even that is nothing compared with Paramatma realization, Bhagavan realization. That Brahman realization is just the beginning. Yeah, it's just the start. But it's essential. Everyone should know this, that they don't require any outside source of enjoyment. All you have to do is sit down somewhere quiet and contemplate your own consciousness. And when consciousness is in touch with consciousness, that's the spiritual energy. And so you feel bliss automatically. This is elementary, my dear disciples. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so number 28, possessing equilibrium. A person who is unaffected by attachment and envy is said to possess equilibrium. An example of Krishna's equilibrium is given in the 10th canto, 16th chapter, verse 33 of Srimad Bhagavatam, in connection with his chastising Kaliya, the hundred-headed serpent. While Kaliya was being severely punished, all of his wives appeared before the Lord and prayed as follows. Dear Lord, you have descended to punish all kinds of demoniac living creatures. Our husband, this Kaliya, is a greatly sinful creature, and so your punishment for him is quite appropriate. We know that your punishment for your enemies and your dealings with your sons are both the same. We know that it is in thinking of the future welfare of this condemned creature that you have chastised him. 
see. So Krishna is never angry. Krishna is never vindictive. He's never jealous. He's never envious. Krishna is always equal to everyone. Yeah? And the, the touch of Krishna's lotus feet on the heads of Kaliya was just as good for him as the touch of Krishna's lotus feet on the heads of his sons. See? This is a, this is a, a custom in ancient Vedic society that in the morning the, the children will come and they'll offer obeisances to the lotus feet of their parents and take their, take their feet and actually put them on their heads. And then in return the parents will offer so many affection, so many affectionate uh, gestures to the children. And that way everybody knows that they're loved. Huh? It's really very nice. I mean, so, such a nice society.